show, I have a very special guest, Dr. Rachel Hannell. Rachel is a former newspaper reporter and copy editor, and she teaches creative writing at Minnesota State University. She is the author of more than 20 nonfiction books for children. Her first adult book is titled, We'll Be the Last Ones to Let You Down, Memoir of a Gravedigger's Daughter. She's also the author of Not the Camilla We Knew, a book about Camilla Hall, a pastor's daughter from small town Minnesota, who eventually joined the ranks of the notorious Symbionese Liberation Army before dying in a shootout in Los Angeles. I invited Rachel on the show to talk about the Symbionese Liberation Army, or the SLA for short, and Patty Hearst. The SLA was an American militant far-left organization active in California between 1973 and 1975. They kidnapped Patty Hearst, the granddaughter of newspaper mogul William Randolph Hearst, from her Berkeley dorm in February of 1974. What follows is a bizarre story that includes extortion and Hirsch joining the ranks of the SLA. The story climaxes with a bank robbery gone wrong. I had heard of the SLA and Patty Hearst in passing before I talked to Rachel, but I had no idea just how incredible and strange this story really is. Rachel was kind enough to walk me through what happened in 1974 and how much of it is still relevant 50 years later. You can find Rachel on Twitter and on her website at rachelhannell.com. I've posted links in the show notes to her social, her website, and her books. Enjoy my conversation with Rachel. I certainly heard the name, didn't know the whole story. And then, as I connected with you, came across this group called the Symbionese Liberation Army, SLA. And I'd never heard of them. And so when I started to dig into it a little bit to prep for this interview with you, I don't, I don't know, I was just riveted and fascinated right away. And I was hoping, you know, you were the expert. You've written a book, you know, about them. You know, can you set some context for how they were formed? You know, what was their mandate? You know, where they operated, that sort of thing in the early 1970s? Yes. Uh, so the Symbionese Liberation Army was really born out of this quite revolutionary time, you know, at least here in the United States. Um, that really came out of the 1960s. So you had a lot of protests going on in the 60s. Um, you know, Vietnam War was going on, uh, the civil battle for civil rights, battle for equal opportunity and that kind of thing. Um, so a lot of people, you know, millions of people took to the streets to protest. Uh, what they saw were really a lot of injustices and really protesting the government, especially with the Vietnam War actions. So, But by the late 60s and early 70s, a lot of that had died off. I mean, there were some gains being made in the era or in the area of civil rights. Um, the Vietnam War was still going on, but frankly, I think a lot of people were just tired. You know, they had been fighting for years and, and thought, okay, what good is this doing? I'm just going to go on and live my life and get a job and get married and et cetera. But so by the early 70s, there's still, there's still quite a few people who still feel very strongly, you know, about that they should keep up the protest movement. And these people tended to be a little bit more revolutionary or militaristic in their tactics because they saw that nonviolence wasn't working. And there were a lot of revolutions going on around the world at the time, violent revolutions in Eastern Europe and South America, uh, Cuba. Uh, so a lot of people said, you know what, we, we let's step it up a notch. You know, if we have to take up arms, if we have to be violent, we're going to do that. And so that's really where the SLA came out of that era. And on the surface, if you read their their manifestos, you know, kind of their founding documents, I mean, it's things I think most people would agree with. Yes, people should be treated fairly and they should be treated equally and you know women or um gay rights and civil rights and discrimination like let's let's get rid of those things and let's just have this really fair and equitable society like that was their foundation but clearly to take it to the next level to say we're willing to do whatever it takes even if that means being violent um is where you know where they were uh not everybody was going to agree uh, with them using those kind of tactics. Yeah, and they were operating, from what I understand, primarily in kind of the San Francisco Bay Area uh, during the 70s. Is that correct? That is correct, exactly. So um, Ber- Berkeley was really their home base, Berkeley, Oakland area, the East Bay 
and uh, Berkeley uh, at that time, you know, just really was a hotbed of progressive thinking. It wasn't uncommon to go to Berkeley and find people who were who were really, really progressive um, in their politics. It's where the free speech movement was born in 1964. So if you wanted to be with like-minded people who were kind of willing to do anything, Berkeley and Oakland were natural places to go. And um, again, this is just stuff I read, and I know you're much more well-versed on the subject, so I was curious to get your take on this. But I think I read somewhere that kind of the U.S. government and the FBI considered the SLA one of the first left-wing terrorist, domestic terrorist organizations in the United States. Is that a fair characterization? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, the uh, it's, it's really fascinating when you dig into it a little bit more to see exactly what the what the FBI knew and kind of the people they were keeping their eyes on. Um, for example, the the Black Panther movement that that was started in 1966. Um, I mean, the FBI was willing to do whatever it took, inc- including uh, intimidation, including murder, to squash that kind of revolutionary thought. Um, so they definitely had their eyes on groups uh, like the SLA. Before we kind of intersect how Patty and the SLA come together. Let's talk about Patty Hearst herself. And uh, I think, I'm sure a few listeners have heard the name. Uh, I think a lot of people probably um, associate Patty with with kind of her family, famous family history. Can you kind of uh, fill in the blanks there about uh, about her, I think it's her grandfather who was um, pretty well known. But yeah, can you, can you tell us a little bit about yeah. that? Yeah, certainly. Definitely the Hearst name is still just a really, really, a well-known name in, in terms of um, media empires. And so the, the Hearst family really uh, started this this large media enterprise, and it was her, her grandfather was William Randolph Hearst, and I think a lot of people would have heard of his name too. Um, he started in San Francisco and then went to New York, and this was around the, the early, um, turn of the 20th century. And it was really the era of what we called yellow journalism and tabloid wars and um, so media just had a, a, a ton of attention during that time. And so William Randolph Hearst really made his name and, and clearly made um, a lot of money running running newspapers. Um, and so that really was the genesis of this famous family. And then, of course, he had children. Um, one of his sons was Randolph Hearst. And then Patty Hearst uh, was one of Randolph's daughters. And by February of 1974, I think that's right, Patty is uh, Mm -hmm. at Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley, and she's kidnapped by the SLA. And this is kind of where the the SLA and the Patty story intersect. What was the motivation behind the SLA kidnapping someone like Patty? What was their goal? Like, what did they want to do? What did they want to achieve by kidnapping her? Yeah, so they wanted to kidnap somebody um, who had, you know, who was really relatively well known so they could get publicity for their group. Um, Kidnappings weren't super common in the U.S. Um, There's a few instances, um, you know, throughout the decades of of, uh, famous people or children of famous people being kidnapped and held for ransom. Um, But certainly in a place like uh, South America uh, that I had talked about earlier being a hotbed of revolutionary activity during this time, kidnappings were really common. So the SLA kind of took a took a cue from those groups and said, hey, if we want to raise our profile and get some attention, let's kidnap a famous person. And, and they had a list, you know, Patty wasn't the only one on their list, but um, they settled on her, I guess, because they thought maybe, you know, it was going to be I guess, uh, easy maybe to kidnap her. She was uh, living with her fiance. She was 19 years old. Um, she had somewhat rejected her family's um, wealth and prominence. She's living in a very kind of just average apartment uh, in Berkeley. It's not like she has, you know, security guards around her or anything like that. So she was a relatively um, accessible person despite her fame. Maybe a bit of a crime of opportunity too, in terms of, like you said, not having security, being at Berkeley, you know, like kind of where they were operating. It sounds like it was a, she was a pretty easy target in a sense. I think so. Absolutely. Yes. I guess weeks, months after she's been kidnapped, um, she kind of, I don't know if she formally announces this or if it's reported, but she's actually ends up joining the SLA. Is this something she's coerced into? She decides to do on her own free will? Is there maybe a bit of like Stockholm syndrome going on here? Like, can you kind of fill in the blanks on why Patty would, you know, after she's been kidnapped by this organization, seemingly join it in their ranks? 
Yeah, it's a great question, and I think that's part of the reason why people still talk about Patty Hearst to this day, because there's just a really great mystery around her exact motive motivation. So I think it's on April 3rd, 1974, about two months after she's kidnapped, she, she's, uh, she releases a tape, or the SLA releases a tape, and her voice is on it, and she's saying hey, I've spent time with this group. I really, they've taught me so much. I really agree with their tactics. I'm going to stay with them and I've joined them. And now my name is Tanya. And uh, they released a photo of her holding a machine gun in front of the SLA flag. So as you can imagine, this just took everyone by surprise. And it was just such a bizarre, bizarre thing. I mean, it, it got a lot of attention. Um, it's hard not to think that she wasn't coerced. Um, during those two months, she is held hostage. She's kept in a closet for about six weeks. She's sexually assaulted. Um, the SLA members are continually coming into the closet to read their manifestos, you know, so whether, you know, if she's brainwashed or Stockholm syndrome, um, it's very easy to see where, where absolutely that that could have been a, a very real factor. It's, it's very hard to believe that that as a 19-year-old, you know, relatively privileged woman, that, that suddenly she decides that, yes, a revolutionary life is the one I would like to lead. Um, a little hard to believe, but also not completely out of the realm of possibility. Yeah, and that's kind of, I think that's where the, the loose knowledge that I had about Patty kind of ended. I was like, oh, yeah, I think I remember hearing about her joining some, you know, sort of like radical left-wing group, um, which, again, you know, if you set the context of what's happening in the United States at the time, like you said, it's not, it wouldn't be that unheard of for people to maybe do something like this, but where the story got really kind of insane for me. And this is the part that, you know, just having, uh, not known the story so well, I was shocked. So in, on April 15th, 1974, Patty and, and I believe a few other members of the SLA walk into a bank, uh, with rifles and rob it. Can you tell me what happened on that day and, and why Patty's involved? Yes. So the SLA needs money. Uh, you know, they're, they're renting an apartment. So they obviously have to buy food and supplies and that kind of thing. And they're running low on cash. And so they decide to, to rob a bank. And so they go to the Hibernia Bank in San Francisco and um, five of them go into the bank and Patty being one of them. And so Patty's job during the heist is to basically stand guard. Um, again, she has her machine gun with her. Um, you know, to intimidate the people who are in the bank and, and, you know, if anyone were to fight, you know, to actually shoot. Um, no shots were fired, um, at least inside the bank. A couple of shots were fired um, as they were leaving, not seriously injuring anyone. Um, but if you watch the footage, uh, the security camera footage of that day, you know, you clearly see Patty kind of holding court there uh, in the bank lobby and people are on the floor and she's just there to to try to, you know, assure that nobody causes trouble while the rest of them can go behind um, the counter and pay cash. And they took about $10,000. And there's also another woman, I believe that's part of the bank robbery that day, Camilla Christine Hall. Um, you've written a book in part about this woman and the SLA. I'm wondering, can you tell me a little bit about uh, Camilla and, uh, and the book? Yes. Uh, so Camilla Hall was a member of the SLA. And one thing also to know, the SLA was very, very tiny. There were eight members. And then when they uh, captured Patty's, I, I guess that made nine, you know, nine people who were there to um, commit crimes. Uh, so Camilla is a member of the SLA. She is originally from Minnesota, which, again, is where I live. Um, I had never heard of her. I had heard of Patty Hearst. I knew of the SLA. Um, but just because Patty was so famous and her case was so bizarre, she definitely dominates any storyline we have of the SLA. But when I learned about uh, Camilla, I thought, wow, here's a really fascinating person um, because uh, here's somebody who seems very unlikely to join a terrorist organization. Uh, again, from southern Minnesota, her dad's a pastor. He's a pastor. He's a theology professor. Um, people who knew Camilla, uh, people who were friends with her, um, she just sounded like the, the nicest, kindest, most caring person that you would have ever met. No inkling of, of anger or violence. And so when it comes out later that, that she is a member of the SLA, um, any, you know, her parents and other people who knew her were just completely gobsmacked. They, they had no idea that 
that she would have become involved in something like this. So I was really interested in that transformation. How does somebody go from being very unlikely uh, to take up violent tactics in the name of revolution um, to actually doing that. And that's why I decided to dig into her life and write a book about her. There's a lot to talk about here, and I'm going to try and go slow because, yeah, I want to make sure we kind of cover it chronologically as well. So they're they're in the bank, Camilla, Patty, these other members of the SLA. Um, you said they got, what was it, about $15,000 in cash? About about ten thousand dollars. About ten thousand. Okay, uh, so it's a decent decent sum, especially in the nineteen seventies. What happens yeah. after the bank robbery? Like, what happens to Camilla, Patty, and the rest of the group? And I guess you know, I know there's kind of a lot of different paths here to go down and resolutions, but uh, maybe we can start with Camilla and Patty, and then get into the other members of the SLA. Yeah, so after, I mean, they get away. They they get away free and clear from the bank robbery. And this is over two months since the kidnapping. And one thing also to to keep in mind and to consider, I, I mean, this is the most famous situation going on at the time. You know, the, this group has a very famous hostage in Patty Hearst. Um, and the FBI, law enforcement, just cannot seem to to find these people, you know, and, and really they're kind of hiding in plain sight. So they do get away uh, from the bank robbery. It's at that point that they realize, okay, here's everyone who's involved. And so Camilla and Patty, they go on the FBI most wanted posters. And so now it's, you know, really this, this national thing because this crime had been committed. Um, and But they do. They do manage to... Um, stay in hiding in the San Francisco Bay Area. But only for about two or three weeks, by early May, they start to um, uh, really feel uh, closed in. And they say, well, let's go somewhere else. Um, A couple of them had some familiarity with the Los Angeles area. So they decide to go to Los Angeles in early May. Once they get to Los Angeles, what happens from there? Like, I think this is when things start to go relatively south for the group, right? Yeah, yeah, it goes it goes all very quickly. Uh, they they don't really have a plan. They're they're just thinking, let's go to L.A. Um, they go to South Central L.A., which is an interesting choice because the entire group is uh, made up of white people, except for for one and Donald DeFreeze. Um, so if you're going to hide, um, probably a predominantly black area of Los Angeles would not be a great place to go, but they do. And, and they, they're they kind of squatting in one house for a while that doesn't have any electricity or gas hookup or anything or water. Um, and then they decide, well, we have to find, you know, some, some other place to go. And they, they really just start knocking on doors and they middle of the night, they find this house and they find these occupants who are willing to just, you know, let them stay there. They bring in all of their guns and ammunition, and but word quickly spreads throughout the neighborhood that hey, here's these kind of crazy, radical people living like living in this house down the road. Um, so at that point, the police um, are quickly able to figure out what's going on. So the police close in on the group, and there's a pretty violent confrontation um, that happens. Can you can you walk us through that? And and I think Camilla is part of that from what from what I remember reading. So by the time the police actually close in and really are able to pinpoint them to this particular location, there's six SLA members there. Three are not there, and those three include Bill and Emily Harris and Patty Hearst. So those three had been um, sent off to get some supplies. So they had gone to a sporting goods store to buy some whatever gun supplies and that kind of thing. Um, Bill Harris decides to take a pair of socks and put them in his pocket and and shoplift them. The clerk, you know, sees this happening, goes after him. There's a shootout. Um, So now the Harrises and Hearst are involved in a shootout at the sporting goods store. So they have to flee and try to escape, and they do. Um, There's a parking ticket in a van that they had to uh, leave behind. Uh, And that parking ticket leads police to the house where the six others are. Um, So by the time the police um, get to that house, they know the SLA is in there. Huge police presence. Uh, 400 police officers are sent to this location, including members of a newly formed SWAT team um, that the LAPD has. And a shootout ensues. Um, Really, all we have... uh, 
regarding knowledge of the situation is the official police report. So the official police report is going to say shots were fired at us. We decided to, you know, return gunfire. Uh, Camilla is one of them in the house. She comes out of the house and again, according to the police, um, starts shooting. Police shoot her uh, in the head and kill her. Um, and then within about an hour, the house goes up in flames and everyone, uh, the SLA members inside, um, all die. Wow. And is Patty the only survivor from, from those SLA members? Um, Patty and the Harrises are still out there. So when they had to flee, you know, the scene of the shootout at the sporting goods store, um, you know, they abandon their van, they they hijack somebody else's car, they drive around for a while, they end up in a hotel near um, Disneyland. And so they're watching this shootout on TV, you know, as their fellow comrades are, are dying. Eventually, from what I understand, they're captured. Um, how do the police track down the three remaining survivors of the SLA? Yeah, it took a while. So again, for um, such a high-profile case, um, this group managed to to elude authorities for almost a year and a half. Um, the, the three of them get back to Berkeley after the shootout. They try to find some other people. They try to regroup, you know, and find other people to help them. And they do. They find a few other um, willing participants. And so, again, it's a, it's a very small group of people who are part of the SLA. Um, the, the Harrises and Hearst and some others are, are kind of going back and forth across the country. They end up in Pennsylvania for a while. They come back to California. Um, but eventually they land in Sacramento. There's another bank robbery in which a woman is killed, uh, a mother of four, um, is shot and killed during this bank robbery. She was there to deposit money from her church. Um, so it's a very, very sad story. Um, and then it's in September 1975 that law enforcement officials are finally able to track down Harris's and Hearst and uh, some of the others. And that second bank robbery or that other bank robbery where the that woman bystander is killed, that's directly like that. It sounds like it was one of the SLA members. Do we know if it was Patty who killed her? Like, was there any, um, did they, were they ever able to figure that out? Yeah, I don't think it was, they knew it wasn't Patty, um, but I think it's a little unclear of exactly who shot her, but it was definitely uh, one of the SLA members. Right. Okay. And then, so they're, they're captured and Patty is tried and found guilty. What's, um, what's her sentence and the sentence for the other two members of the, the SLA? Like, um, how much time did they end up serving? Yeah. So, so Patty, she is convicted. She's convicted of bank robbery, um, and using a firearm during the bank robbery. Um, obviously her trial is huge, right? Kind of like the trial of the century, uh, before the OJ Simpson trial. Um, and she has the best defense, of course, because her family's very wealthy. F. Lee Bailey is one of her lawyers, but they they are not able to um, uh, find her uh, not guilty. The jury finds her guilty, and she is sentenced uh, to prison. And the same with the Harrises as well. Um, none of them ended up serving very long, like in terms of how long you would think maybe somebody would serve for committing these kind of crimes, you know, a few years. Um, but Patty got off quite early um, from her sentence uh, because President Jimmy Carter commuted her sentence. And then President Bill Clinton granted her a pardon uh, in 2001. That seems kind of wild to me, given her crimes. Like, is there a reason given for it? Or it's just like her connection with her grandfather, the, the Hearst name? Like, can you give us some context there why her sentence was commuted? Yeah, I would definitely say it's her. it, it was her fame. Absolutely. Um, any put any other person at the scene of a bank robbery and using a firearm during a bank robbery, and I doubt a president is going to commute their sentence. So definitely, her her privilege is working in her favor at this point. Yeah, I was gonna say it's hard when I was reading, and now that I've been listening to you tell this story, it's hard to feel bad for her, just given the, you know, the privileged background she came from, and the subsequent crimes and we can get into before we get into kind of like the overall legacy of of the of the SLA and Patty I wanted to kind of get a sense of what her life was like after she's her sentence is commuted um you know I, I was reading a little bit about it and it seems like maybe on the surface she tries to do some good like can you tell us a little bit about what Patty gets up to after she gets out of jail or prison I guess yeah she she really kind of 
kind of um, ends up living this life that seemed to be meant meant for her from the beginning. You know, she moves to suburban New York. She lives in a giant house. Um, she actually marries her bodyguard, so one of the men that had been um, hired to protect her during the, the trial and, you know, bail he- hearings and, and all of that. Uh, she marries him. They have a couple of kids. Um, you know, she is active in, in charity work. Um, she's raising show dogs, and so it was a few years ago. I think one of her dogs won the, the Westminster Kennel Club show. John Waters kind of took her under his wing. She's acted in some John Waters movies. So, yeah, it's quite a varied life uh, she has led uh, since her release from prison. It's kind of a wild, wild story. I think that's why people are drawn to it. What's the overall, I guess, like legacy? Like, you know, I'm trying to get a sense of what this story means now. Like, why, you know, why do you think people are still interested in it? I mean, the SLA basically died on that day in Los Angeles. I mean, because most of the members are killed either in a shootout or in that house fire. And then, you know, the, the two founding members and Patty are subsequently captured. So, like, is there, you know, does the SLA ever surface again, maybe as a different name or by different people? Like, can you give us a sense of, like, what the overall legacy of this SLA and Patty Hearst saga means today and from your perspective like yeah why are people so fascinated with it yeah so the SLA really you know by the time Hearst and the Harrises are captured it's over with you know nobody nobody else is um, trying to pick up that banner Um, some people who were involved in the SLA at that point they had gone underground um, so they went into hiding and and in some cases for over a couple of decades but at this point in time um, everybody associated um, with them, you know, has, has been caught and, and served their time and, and now are released. Um, I think definitely Patty's story is just so bizarre that it is fascinating. And there is kind of that enduring mystery of was she brainwashed or did she really actually actively participate in this group? And one of the reasons the jury did find her guilty is because she was on the run for a long time, almost a year and a half, and the jury said, well, if you if you didn't believe in this group and you really felt you were in danger, why didn't you just leave? She was alone a lot. Um, so they said, why why would you not just walk to the nearest police station or call your family or something? So they, they found that very hard to believe, and I think that's why we still have um, some debate about um, Patty's role in the SLA. But I think one reason why especially now people are interested in this story is because uh, we're starting to, I think we're starting to see some similar things happening, at least here in the States. Um, We're living in a a time where, again, people are frustrated by the government. Um, People are frustrated by the 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 lack of response of the government um, people are frustrated by what they see as continued discrimination it seems like we're, we're fighting a lot of the same fights that we were fighting in the 60s and 70s uh, and here in the states when you look at january 6 2021 you had a whole group of people who said we are so mad and frustrated we are willing to resort to violence uh, when we had the capital uh, insurrection uh, so i think that Uh, There are groups of people out there again today who say, you know what, if we have to um, take up arms and resort to violence, um, we're going to do that. And um, I think the SLA is just a, a case study, I guess, or a cautionary tale for us today. Yeah, and with the, I think you said when we were kind of setting this up that it's coming up to the fifth. Is it the fiftieth anniversary of the Patty Hearst saga and the SLA? I think. Yes, it is. Yeah, it's fifty years already. Yeah, I guess I, I, I'm imagining Patty probably doesn't speak out or do anything around these anniversaries. I'm assuming she probably just remains quiet. Is there anything to be learned about what happened and, and the Patty Hearst saga? Because I really liked the way you just kind of tied it into what's happening in America and you know to a lesser extent in Canada as well, like. Um, you know, is there anything to look back as we approach the 50th anniversary and, you know, take something away that we can maybe move forward and be better as a whole, uh, as a society with, you know, having learned from from watching what happened in the 70s with the SLA and Patty? Yeah, it, 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 would, it would be nice if we could see it as a cautionary tale, you know, and uh, for people involved in politics and people involved in those kind of decision making, you know, like, hey, can't we live in a, in a fair and just world and where both sides can just work together and, um, you know, and, and not be so um, uh, 
just uh, stubborn about, you know, just getting their way. That that would be really nice. But I think for kind of just the, the average person, I think of Camilla when I think of this. And um, I think of her parents when they last saw her in Christmas uh, 1973. They could tell something was wrong. Um, she She was agitated. She was upset. She was definitely talking in a much more darker way than, than usually she, she would. Um, and they just said, well, you know, like a lot of the young people are frustrated uh, today. So I think Camilla's just frustrated. But looking back on it, they, they always said that they wish they would have asked her more questions. And so I, I often think about that. You know, are there people around us that we know that, that we can see, you know, getting frustrated or they're upset instead of just like dismissing them or, or leaving them alone, like, is it just worth having some conversations? Because sometimes people just want to talk, right? Um, and that can, can kind of lessen the mood. So, you know, I think just maybe more reaching out to people who, who seem really frustrated or upset at the very least, um, I think is maybe one lesson that we can take from this. Thanks for listening to my interview with Rachel. If you want to find out more, please check out the show notes. I have linked to Rachel's social and her website down there, as well as her books. If you want to support the podcast, there's a few ways you can do that. The first being you can buy me a coffee, or you can sign up for the Patreon, which is only $5 a month and guarantees you'll get ad and sponsor-free episodes early. If you don't want to spend any money, that's okay. Please consider supporting the podcast by leaving a five-star review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. If you're looking for updates on the podcast, you can check out the Patreon or you can check out the Facebook page. There's a link to the Facebook page in the show notes as well as the Patreon, Buy Me a Coffee, and any other links to do with the podcast. Thanks for listening to the Missing and Unexplained podcast.